Well, good morning, online family. I'm so excited that you have joined with us again this morning. And hey, if you are just checking us out for the first time, extra special shout out to you. Good morning and welcome. My name is Megan Fondren. And I ask that just before you log off today, click the link that you'll see below in your comment section. That's going to take you to our guest information page. Put all your info on there because we want to connect with you, get to know you, and then meet you someday in person. So do that before you log off. And hey guys, we have a lot of announcements this morning, so listen up closely. I even have my paper so that I don't forget. Um, first of all, if you were at the Teen Challenge service when they were visiting with us two Sundays ago and you took one of the name tags to buy a gift for the Teen Challenge people, don't forget that that gift is due to the church no later than Sunday, December 20th. Bring it on out, put it under the Christmas tree, or find one of the staff members in the office, whatever, to give that gift to. Again, no later than December 20th. 20th so that we can get those gifts delivered to the Teen Challenge people. Also, speaking of Christmas time, it's the most wonderful time of the year for sure. We at Lamb of God Fellowship are hosting our Christmas Eve service. It's going to be the candlelight service like usual. It's going to be an awesome time in worship, just celebrating the reason for the season. Come on out at Lamb of God Fellowship Christmas Eve at 7 p.m. It's going to be a great, great time. And the youth group this year is having an awesome Christmas party for all youth ages or 6th grade through 12th grade. And that is going to be happening on Sunday. Sunday, December 20th. More information about the time and the details of that is to come. You can go to our Facebook page or web page to check that out a little bit more. And the youth group is also hosting a New Year's Eve party on New Year's Eve, December 31st, starting at 8 p.m. at the church. And the most exciting thing about this is that there is going to be a Nintendo Switch giveaway. That's right, folks. So if you wanna come on out to that, get your name put in the drawing for this Nintendo Switch. And the more people that you bring as guests, the more entries you get into this drawing. So if you bring five friends, you get your name in at least five times. Your odds are pretty good that way. So bring all your friends, get everybody sixth grade through 12th grade out to this awesome, awesome youth party that they're having for New Year's Eve, the 31st of December, starting at 8 p.m. at the church. It's gonna be an awesome time. Also, the um, XO Conference, which we're calling XO Date Night this year, coming up again in February. The early bird special is going on, so check out the information on that. I want to take time to take communion with you all as our extended family. And even if you don't call Lamb of God Fellowship your home church, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're a part of the family, so go grab something to represent the elements so that we can take communion together. This morning, I have just a little piece of a cheese it which I love and some water so let's not forget the reason that we take the time intentionally week after week to take communion is because there is power in this um, ritual it's not just some dead religious ritual to those who believe in the power of Jesus Christ this is where the resurrection power is brought to life within us every time we take communion we are proclaiming that we still believe in that power today so that body that was broken for you. That's why we're taking a piece of a broken piece of bread and that blood that was spilled. It is still for you today for your body to be made whole and healthy and for your chains to be broken once and for all and for you to just live a life of freedom and fullness. So let's pray together and celebrate that this morning. God, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that your power never dwindles. It never fizzles out, Lord. It is still so alive, and it is active, and it is flowing through our veins. Let us never forget that as believers, as joint heirs with Christ. So I proclaim and declare today health and wholeness over my body and the bodies of my brothers and sisters who are partaking with me this morning in this meal. And Lord, I just thank you for that blood that was so freely given, Jesus. Thank you for the freedom of our chains, of our past sins, our shame, our guilt. God, the burden that we feel we need to bear in this life is not ours because you said and you declared that it is finished. So we declare that over ourselves today. We don't have any work left to do. We can just walk and step into the freedom and the fullness that you have for us. And we claim it today. I claim it for myself, my family, and my brothers and sisters in Christ. I just thank you so much, Lord. We love you and we praise you. Amen.
amen. There is power in the blood. Don't you forget it, guys. Well, Cindy Robinson has a quick announcement, and then Pastor Tim is going to bring a great message. You guys have an awesome day, an awesome week. I love you. I miss you. I'm rooting for you to be more than conquerors in Christ. I will see you next week. Hi, Lamb of God Fellowship. My name is Cindy Robinson. Just in case you guys don't know me, I am uh, so excited to tell you guys about the challenge that Pastor Tim is putting out to us. I have a passion for missions, and one mission that our church supports is Cindy's Hope. Cindy's Hope is located in Rwanda, and uh, she is building schools uh, to help spread the gospel, as well as help kids in the poorest of poor communities learn uh, not only how to speak, how to write, but also the love of God. During this COVID time, schools haven't been able to be in session, but boy, Cindy's Hope is still making a difference. They have been able to feed 102,000 meals to kids, parents. Um, they have a Bible study, 200 men attending the Bible study. They have been able to um, help malnourished mothers as well as children. And um, it is amazing what a vision Cindy and Cindy's Hope is doing. Cindy is building another school. She's got two in Rwanda already. She's she's going to do a third one. And once again, it's going to be in the poorest of poor communities. She's going to have six different classrooms. And in each of those classrooms, there's going to be 24 kids. And right now, she's got kids banging down the door wanting to go to her school. So we're, they're not lacking students, but they are lacking materials. And so for $12,500, we can supply all of the things that those kids are going to need. Desks, chairs, flooring, electricity. And so as a church, I am challenging us in the next couple of weeks to raise that $12,500 and bless those, these amazing kids in Rwanda, Africa. I'm going to show you guys a video of Cindy, and I hope that you are blessed as I am. Good morning, Lamb of God Fellowship, and welcome to Cindy's Hope. We will be building six more classrooms in Mogo, Rwanda, but we need your help. One classroom is $12,500, which, you know what, our God's not broke. This is so easy, but I need your help. Will you partner with us here at Cindy's Hope? So if you want to be part of this challenge that uh, Pastor Tim is giving us of raising $12,500, click on the link below. It'll take you to a website where you can donate. May God bless you richly during this holiday season. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you again today, and thanks for joining in. Whether you're watching us uh, as our normal routine here on Sunday mornings or you're visiting with us, I just want to welcome you. And we are doing a series uh, about Christmas, and it's called Walking on the Path of Peace. And last week we started the series, so uh, you can check out last week's message as well. But today I want to talk about this path of peace that's mentioned in Luke chapter 1, verses 78 and 79. Okay, it goes like this. Um, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Uh, these are the words of Zechariah, who was John the Baptist's dad, and he was prophesying by the Spirit of the Lord just before Jesus uh, was born. And uh, actually, this was at the birth of John the Baptist, but he was talking about Jesus. You may, you may not have heard the, the name Jesus in that uh, sentence, but there are two different phrases in here that's, that's really, well, one key phrase that's talking about the Messiah, and it's the phrase, the rising sun. This was a recognized messianic title. And so when he says, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun or the Messiah will come. So the Messiah would come to us from heaven and to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And so Jesus came as the Messiah, as the rising sun to guide us or to guide our feet into the path of peace. And so that's what this series is about, is walking on this path of peace. And I want to continue what we were talking about last week, because Christmas is the initiating of a new path of peace made possible by Jesus. This new path, this new way, because he came into a dark world, our world, fallen, broken, dark, and the light of God, Jesus himself, came into our chaos to bring us out of that chaos and walk us into a totally new 
uh, living way. And, and we're talking about that in terms of the path of peace that he is guiding us on. So this path of peace is meant for us to walk in. In other words, it's not an event, but this is a journey that God invites us into. And it's not that we need to become a Christian. The reality is we are becoming Christ-like. Some people think, well, I'll just pray a prayer, I'll get right with God, and then I'll go and live my life. But that's not the message of heaven. The message of heaven is there is a new way to live. This is not a religion. This is a new life with God in fellowship with him. And we're not becoming Christians. We are becoming like Christ. We are becoming like him by following him in this path of peace. And of course, peace uh, means a whole lot of things. It means freedom, healing, uh, it means health, prosperity. I like to say it means nothing missing, nothing broken. It is the all-inclusive well-being word uh, of Hebrew uh, of blessing and prosperity for us, body, soul, and spirit. And it is the word shalom. And this path of peace is the path of life that Jesus made possible for you and I to live in and to journey on. This path is a path of redemption, restoration, reconciliation, renewal and revival for your body, your soul, and your spirit. So that's what we're talking about. And Psalm 51, 6 says uh, about God, God, you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place, in our soul. And so we are continuing to learn how to replace the lies uh, of our culture, of our upbringing, of our experiences, the pain, the hurt that we have lived with, the chaos that we're used to, and we're replacing that with the truth of God that sets us free. As we walk into this path of peace, God is walking us out of the path of chaos, of the path of hurt, the path of rejection. I don't know what your path looks like, but what, what has what kind of path have you been walking on? What has your journey looked like to you? Because there is a new way that's made available now through Christmas, through Jesus coming, the Messiah showing up. And now through what Jesus has done for us, he has opened this new way for us to experience peace. You may, your path may have been filled with hurt, with jealousy, with anger, with betrayal, with addiction, uh, with pain, uh, with rejection, loneliness. I mean, we could go on and on and on because we have all walked on those paths. And the good news of Christmas is that God loves us so much. He came into our chaos, into our darkness, right? He came into our brokenness and he opened a way for a brand new experience, a fellowship with him and a healing for our souls. We don't have to walk on that path of destruction anymore. Jesus has come to guide our feet onto the path of peace. That's what I want to talk about today. So last week, just a quick review. The first step on this path was already taken for us by Jesus himself, who defeated sin, he defeated the devil, and he's defeated death on our behalf. Because he has done that, we now have a new way to walk in. That's what we're talking about. Sin no longer defines us. We are not defined by our failures. We're not defined by our mistakes. We're not defined by our regrets. We're not defined by the labels of other people. We're not defined by any of that stuff anymore because we are new in Jesus. Our identity is now in Christ. We are a new creation in him. He has set us free from sin. He has set us free from the devil's power over us. And he will set us free and resurrect us from death itself. In fact, the moment that we place our faith in Christ, we are born again and our spirit comes alive. And we start to taste and live in this new eternal life that's already a part of our existence. And that's what we're celebrating today. And so here's the step, the first step Jesus took by defeating sin, the devil, and death. But today, I want to talk about how we need to take our step of faith by trusting in Jesus. And most of the people that are probably watching this right now, you, you, most people like yourself may be a Christian, 
But there may be some, and you may be one, a person who's watching this, uh, that isn't a Christian yet, hasn't placed your faith in Jesus. Maybe you're just, you know, learning about this or uh, thinking about it. And today I want to invite you to place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because just because Jesus came and he did defeat sin and the devil and death, there's a step that all of us need to take of our own will and accord, and that is to trust and place our faith in him. And that's what we're talking about today. What does it mean to be reconciled to God? That's the set step that really gets us on the path is to be reconciled with God. Jesus opened the path through his death and his resurrection, okay? So the path is now made accessible. It doesn't mean everybody's on that path though. Only those who are now following Jesus, trusting in Jesus, placing their faith in Jesus are the ones who are on that path and beginning to see God replacing the chaos with his peace, beginning to replace the hurt with healing, beginning to restore um, their soul and heal their emotions and heal their bodies and give them new hope and, and new beginning, okay? It's only those who are placing their faith in Jesus that are on the path. So just because the path is made accessible, not everybody has accessed the path of peace. But it is God's will and desire for every one of us, for you, for me, for your family, for your friends and your coworkers and your fellow students, for all that you know. It is God's will for all of us to get on this path, to experience salvation and life in Jesus and to spend eternity with him. That's God's will. And so I, I invite you to take that step today as we talk about what that means. I'm sure you will be excited to see that God is for you. He's not against you and he loves you and he is with you right now. And you're invited into his family. Isn't that good news? This is what the Bible says um, about this. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul is writing and he's talking to those who are in Corinth and he's, he's talking kind of from a personal place. And he says, therefore, we, he's talking about himself, are ambassadors for Christ. You and I, Christians, are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Paul, his whole life was trying to preach this good news, this gospel to get people to be reconciled to God. And he says, I beg you, we beg you as God's ambassadors, we are his voices now on the earth. And he's talking to unbelievers as well. And he's saying, I, I implore you, I beg you, be reconciled to God, come home to God. And that's my message today to everybody who's watching, listening. I, I, I beg you, I implore you, be reconciled to God. The Messiah has come. He has a new way for you, a way of healing and prosperity and wholeness. It's, a, it's the path of peace. Shalom, shalom. God has shalom for you. It's a new life for you. But you need to take that step by inviting Jesus as your Lord and Savior into your life by surrendering to him. So let's talk about that. This is a memory verse I have for us this week. If you're with us, you know every week I like to give us a memory verse. And it's Colossians chapter 1. And it's actually a couple of verses, verses 21 to 23. Paul is writing and he says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. So Paul is explaining this process of reconciliation. And he says, there is a time in our life when we were alienated from God, right? We were sinners. And in our minds, and I want to point this out, in our minds, we were enemies of God. We thought God was against us, uh, that we were against him, that he, he was mad at us and he was ready to punish us. And so we thought we were enemies of God because of what we've done, our mistakes. But through Jesus, he has reconciled us to God. It says here that through his death, now we are made holy in his sight without blemish, free from accusation. Our sin has been dealt with by Jesus. Isn't that awesome? That's what it means to be reconciled to God, that our sin is forgiven and we are restored in relationship to him. But there's two factors that determine our response to this message. Two factors that determine our, our, our response to the gospel, which I'm sharing with you right now. And the first is a matter of truth versus lies. Truth versus lies. It's we must overcome the lies of the devil 
who is trying to blind us to the love that God has for us. Okay, I'm going to talk about this for a few minutes. Let me read this verse first for you. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says this, the God of this age, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers, literally blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. There's blindfolds right now on many people's eyes who don't understand how much God loves them because the devil has blinded them from the gospel. Jesus put it this way in 844, when he lies, when the devil lies, he speaks his native language for he is a liar and the father of lies. There is no truth in the devil. And from the very beginning, his method of operation for deceiving mankind has been through lying. He doesn't just show up physically and start slapping us around or striking us or hurting us or harming us. He just twists the truth to get us to believe in his lies. And you know, the trouble with, with lies is if we're believing any of them, the fruit of believing the lies of the enemy is always death. It's always anger or brokenness or pain or hurt or rejection or so many dark things come from the lies of the enemy. It's just he's out to destroy us and harm us and hurt us. So we need to overcome the lies of the enemy. And the problem with being with living a lie or believing a lie is that you don't know you're doing it. I mean, nobody's going to believe and live a lie when they know it's a lie. And so the, the trouble is that the lie needs to be exposed. And here's the truth, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The word of God is the truth. And there is a spiritual power that comes when we preach the gospel, the truth from the scriptures that can break those lies that the enemy has been filling us with. There's a whole lot of lies that we, we believe that we're not even aware of. But I want you to just think about a couple of examples that you might be able to relate to. I don't know if any of these lies have been a part of your thinking in the past, or maybe they're still a part of your thinking now, but I just want to break a couple lies off of our lives right now for a few minutes. All right, here's a couple examples. God doesn't really care about me. I've met a lot of people who believe this lie. The devil has convinced them that God doesn't really care about them. But the truth is, God loves you more than you can even comprehend. The Bible says you can't even measure the love of God. It's beyond measurement. And the Bible says that God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son to us. The Bible says that God demonstrated his love to us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There is no greater demonstration of the love of God than for Jesus to give his life for us. So it's a lie to believe that God doesn't really love you or care about you. He certainly does. You can't even fathom how much he loves you. Another lie that a lot of people have is God wasn't there for me. But the truth is God has never left you, ever. God is for you and he's with you. Another lie, God is mad at me. But the truth is God has paid for your sin. As I mentioned just a second ago, while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Not when we got our act together. So Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. So God is not mad. He's come to rescue us and save us. Some believe that God has given up on me, but God will never give up on you. The, the Bible tells us that love never fails, that his love is always persevering, always hoping. God is always for you. He will never give up on you. That's the good news of the gospel. God is for you. He'll never give up. Some be people believe that God is punishing me and the devil is constantly taking the events of our life, the words of other people, the harmful experiences we've had, the painful things that we've gone through, and he's blaming God for those things and twisting those things around as if God caused all this hurt and God has caused all this pain and God hasn't done anything for me and God wasn't there for me. And, and those are all lies from the devil. That is not true at all. God is seeking to save you, to rescue you, to heal you, to redeem you, to restore you, and to bless you. He is for us. He is not against us. So do not believe the lies of the enemy that's trying to blind us from the love of God. Because once the love of God enters our hearts, once we trust in this amazing loving God who made us and created us to be with him forever, we enter into a whole new reality, the path of peace. God begins to heal us when we surrender to him. 
And it's, an, it's a beautiful, totally new experience in him. But the second factor is not just a matter of truth and lies. This, this factor here, once we hear the truth, once we understand the gospel, now it's a matter of obedience versus rebellion. There are some who know the gospel and are just choosing by their own pride and selfishness to continue to stiff arm God and reject God. They want to do life their way. They think that there is more happiness in the way that they can choose to live their life than what God has for them. They're still being deceived, but there is a, a bit of just flat out rebellion and pride and self-centeredness to their position right now with God. The Bible says this in Psalm 10, 4, in his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. And so we have a lot of pride in our world today. There's a lot of people who are just pridefully denying God or not submitting to his leadership of their lives. First Peter 5, 5, the problem with that is that we read in this verse, God is opposed to the proud. He's actually in opposition to those who, who are self-sufficient, you know, supposedly, in their lives, that don't need him, that are pro, pro, you know, filled with their own pride and self-righteousness. The Bible says God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And we need to humble ourselves before God. We need to respond to what the true gospel really is. Not an American Christianity gospel. But the true gospel of Jesus Christ is this. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, deny his pride, deny you know, his self-centeredness, deny himself and all his own ego and identity, and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's what Jesus offers to us. He says, your way doesn't work. I have a new way, but you have to come all in with me. You have to trust me completely. You have to surrender your identity, your dreams, your whole heart, your life to me. And now you will do, once you do that, you will find life in me. That's the offer on the table. You know, what I hear a lot of people or what I sense a lot of people looking for is, well, let me see. I, I, I want God to make me a better person. You know, I want God to fix my problems. Instead, what we should be thinking is that's not the offer on the table that God wants to make, make you a better person or God wants to fix your problems so that you can be better at doing it your way. God wants a new, completely new identity in you. He wants you to die to yourself. He wants you to die to ego and pride and self-centeredness and self-sufficiency. He wants you to learn how to completely surrender and trust in him because the life is in him. It's not in you being a better person. It's not in you getting your, your problems fixed. It's in you trusting and following Jesus, who is, again, the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is this path of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. And as we chase after him, after, as we follow after him, that's where we find healing and freedom and liberty and everything that we truly desire. Again, God wants truth in our inner parts. He wants us to be set free from all the pain and hurt of our past. And it's only through Jesus that we come to that place. So to summarize this, we can be reconciled to God through what Jesus has done for us. But we need to see and believe the truth of the gospel. And we need to overcome our pride by surrendering our identity to Christ by faith. Okay, we need to come to this place that Paul came to when he wrote Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. The word I there in the Greek is ego. My ego, my pride, my self-identity has died with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It's no longer me making a, a purpose of my life here. But he goes on to say, but Christ lives in me. And now the life that I'm living right now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me, who loves me, okay? And that, and, and it gave himself up for me. That is what the gospel is all about. Us not getting a self-improvement package, us dying to ourselves and be made brand new in him. 
That's the path of peace that you're invited to join others on today. And so here's what Romans says in chapter 3, verses 21 to 24. And I want to focus on five last words out of this verse. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Verse 22, I'm going to break this down as we conclude this message with these five key words in this verse. This righteousness is given. The first word is given. Given is, is not earned, it is received. You cannot earn this righteousness from God. You need to receive it though. It's given, we need to receive it. We can't earn it. This righteousness is given through faith. Faith is the second word. Faith, this is not an event. This is not a certain prayer you need to pray. This is a lifelong journey. That's what faith is. A day-by-day, lifelong journey. It is a path that we are walking on. When we talk about our faith, we're not talking about something that we did. We are talking about some, something that we are doing, right? So this is a continual faith that we are trusting in Jesus. We are placing our faith in him. It says this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ, right? So this is not a religion. This is about a relationship of trust. I'm not inviting you to become, to, to somehow enter the religion of Christianity. That's not what the gospel says at all. This says you have been given the opportunity. Will you receive it? To place your faith in a person. Who's the person? The son of God, the Messiah. The one who gave his life for you that you might have life. This is a relationship for the rest of your life. This is not an event. This is not a religion. Okay, a couple more words here as we conclude. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all, to all. Listen, no one is qualified. Therefore, everyone is invited. Okay, no one can do this without the gift of God, the grace of God, without the son of God, without Jesus. So we are all invited to invite him into our life, to surrender our lives to him. No matter what you've done, you have not disqualified yourself because we have all sinned. We have all fallen short, but it is by the grace of God that we are all invited into life eternal through Jesus Christ. The last word here is who believe. Believe. Okay, believe. This is not a head thing. This is a heart thing. This is at the core of who we really are. And this is really what God wants. Out of Psalm 51, 6, when I said, Lord, you desire truth in the inner parts. Who's the truth? Jesus. Remember, for the third time today, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. When God says, you know, he desires truth on the inner parts of who we are, he wants Jesus in the inner parts of who we are. That's the gospel. Today, I invite you to invite Jesus into the inner parts of who you are, to begin to walk on this path of shalom, this path of peace. This is what Christmas is all about. God coming to us. Emmanuel, God coming to us. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, that Jesus was given the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This is Christmas. God has opened a new way for you and for me through the love of, his, through the love of Jesus dying for you and for me. And as we conclude this message, I want to invite you to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And if you feel like you've strayed from God and you just want to recommit your life to him, then join me in this prayer. And if you've never really surrendered your heart to God, then right now is, is your opportunity to do this. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Pray this in your heart from the inner core of who you are and surrender the, your identity to God. Surrender your whole self to him. And let his love flood inside of you and begin to walk you into a brand new journey with him. Okay, let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, today we come to you. We thank you for loving us. 
And Jesus, for those who are praying right now to invite you into their life, to surrender their hearts to you, we pray this prayer together. Jesus, thank you. You've never left me. You've never given up on me. And you paid a price I couldn't pay to set me free from something I couldn't set my free, myself free from. And so today, Jesus, I surrender my heart to you as Lord and Savior. I turn my belief and my trust and my faith to you and you alone. And I pray that you will forgive me of all my sins and wash me clean and fill me with your Holy Spirit and teach me and guide me into this new path of peace, this path of shalom. I surrender my life to you, Lord, and I thank you that I am new in you from this day forward. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God if you just prayed that prayer. I am so happy and excited for you because you literally just entered the path of peace that we've been talking about. We're going to continue to celebrate and talk about this path of peace in the next couple of weeks. But for now, I want to pray just a blessing on you. I love you guys. I miss you guys that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, I'm doing well, and uh, I pray that you're doing well and your family's doing well. But let me leave you with the blessing of the Lord today, okay? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom, right? In his name, amen. Love you guys. Have a great day. Have a great week. Merry Christmas.
everybody. It's me, Jacob. Sorry if it seems like I'm in a rush. Gotta make this quick, cause it's the holidays. So you know what that means? Lots of plans on the old calendar. I got something happening every single day leading up to the big day. Christmas! Christmas is celebrating Jesus, God's greatest gift. So let me see if there's anything new in this big wrapped box. And then I can get busy celebrating. Here we go. No way. This is what Christmas is all about right here. Ginger spiced pecan with a hint of nutmeg, some oregano mixed in just for a little flavor and sprinkled on top with chocolate sprinkles. And then we mix in some of Aunt Dory's famous protein powder just to build the muscle non-dairy, gluten-free, if you can believe it, Dory can make it. And I'm, 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 I'm sensing a hint of chocolate now? She's, she's mixing up, she's gone off the grid, she's mixing up the recipe. It smells so good, but the taste, the taste, oh! I don't have the words to describe the taste of Aunt Dory's famous pie. I'm gonna need to set this down for a second. My family's been going to Aunt Dory's at Christmas time ever since I was a little kid. That's always been the plan. I get to hang out with my cousins and catch up on old times. We always eat the biggest meal. You never saw so many casseroles. But if your belly's smart, it always saves room for the pie. Mmm. Sorry, sorry. Come on, Jacob, get it together. I'm getting distracted by pie. Sorry. This year, we had to change the plan a little bit. Aunt Dory hasn't been feeling too well, and the family thought it'd be best if we wait until she's feeling better before we get together. It's kind of a bummer when plans don't go the way you'd expect, but we're trying to make the best of things. Find things to be joyful about, you know? Hey, the story today is about changing plans. This girl, Mary, she had to change her plans, not just for the holidays, but for her whole life. And do you think she was able to be joyful? We'll find out in just a minute. I think I'll stick around for the, uh, uh, for the story. Hmm. And the pie. Maybe just some pie, just a little bit of pie. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 56. Mary lived in the tiny town of Nazareth, an ordinary village at the edge of Jewish lands. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Mary herself was an ordinary girl. Oh, hello. She grew up learning the Jewish scriptures. A child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, he will rule over us, and he will be called Wonderful Advisor and Mighty God. When will this happen? Only God knows. It's been hundreds of years. Mary went to fetch water from the well and baked loaves of bread and swept out the hard-packed earth floor. It's important to clean the dirt off the dirt. <laughs> she was also engaged to be married to a carpenter named Joseph. Mary must have expected that her life would follow a very ordinary path until one day when everything changed. Greetings, Mary. Suddenly, right there in the dim room, a brilliant being appeared. Mary probably dropped whatever she was holding, a broom, a batch of bread dough, a needle and thread. Who, me? The Lord has blessed you in a special way. He is with you. Mary blinked, trying to take it all in. The whole room glowed with light. I, I don't understand. Do not be afraid, Mary. God is very pleased with you. Mary couldn't find any words. In one heartbeat, her very ordinary day had flipped upside down. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. You must call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. He will rule forever over his people. That kingdom will never end. The words of Isaiah may have echoed in Mary's head. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. 
He will rule over us. She finally found her voice. How can this happen? I'm not even married yet. The light flared even brighter. The Holy Spirit will make this happen. Your relative Elizabeth will have a child even though she is old. People thought she could not have children, but she has been pregnant for six months now. That's because what God says will always come true. Mary's heart pounded. Her cousin Elizabeth was old enough to be a grandmother, and if she was having a baby, anything could happen. I serve the Lord. May it happen to me just as you said it would. The light faded. The towering angel disappeared. Mary leaned against the wall to collect her thoughts. Elizabeth, I have to go see her. The journey to Elizabeth and Zechariah's home in the hill country of Judah would have taken many days of travel along dusty roads. Finally, Mary arrived. Why, it's Mary. Elizabeth, I have so much to tell you. As Mary spoke, Elizabeth could feel the child inside of her leap and kick for joy. God's Holy Spirit spoke to Elizabeth. God has blessed you more than other women, and blessed is the child you will have. As soon as I heard the sound of your voice, the baby inside of me jumped for joy. You are a woman God has blessed. You have believed that the Lord would keep his promises to you. Mary laughed and cried at the same time as she hugged her older cousin. God confirmed once again that Mary could find joy in the extraordinary plan God had for her. Now tell me your story. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for several weeks. She was so filled with joy, she poured out her heart in a song to God. My soul gives glory to the Lord. My spirit delights in God, my Savior. He has taken note of me, even though I'm not considered important. He shows his mercy to those who have respect for him. He has filled with good things those who are hungry. He has helped the people of Israel who serve him. He has done it just as he had promised to our people of long ago. At the end of three months, Mary returned home to Nazareth, ready to see how God's plan was about to unfold. Oh, oh. I can't believe I just ate that whole pie. Almost the whole pie. That was not part of the plan. But hey, I definitely felt the joy. Maybe you're like me, and your plans had to change for some reason this season. Reason season. I rhymed that on purpose. Nah, I'm just teasing. It is totally okay to feel sad when plans don't go the way you expect. I'm sad I don't get to go to Aunt Dory's. But, like Aunt Dory says, you don't have to dwell on the sadness. You don't have to stay sad forever. There could be a bigger reason why plans change. Think about it. Before God revealed his plan, Mary was just like any one of us. She had her own hopes and dreams for the future, just like we do. But her plans changed because God had a bigger plan for her. It's the same with us. My plans, God's plans. God knows everything that's ever happened, and he knows everything that's going to happen. So, he has a plan for you. It may be different than your plan, but trust me, it's a bigger and better plan. So, if you're sad when plans change, that's okay. Just don't dwell there. You can have joy knowing that your plans are in bigger hands. Plans hands, that sort of rhymes. Here's the one thing to remember today. You can have joy because God has a plan for you. It's cool to think that the creator of the universe has a plan just for me. I don't know about you, but that makes me kind of, uh, <laughs> also kind of excited. Huh. And kind of hungry. One more slice of pie won't hurt. Oh, looks like the plans are changing again. Oh boy, the plans are changing fast. I'll catch you next time.